On this episode of Women Behind Bars, one woman is found guilty of murder in the stabbing death of a friend. Antoinette was sitting in a chair, and Angela just reached up on the wall of the shed and pulled a knife, turned around, and stabbed her in the chest. I asked him, did I do that? And he said, yes, you did that. And he just kept holding me down. Then, Sharon Mabry tells her story. She was convicted in the robbery and murder of her pimp and ex-boyfriend. She comes up with this scheme, and she says, Blackie, he always has money on him. He was holding me against my will. He was making me run the brothel, and he was telling me, if you, if you leave the brothel, you're never going to get back in. Two women, two brutal crimes. These are the stories of Angela Turner and Sharon Mabry. On Christmas Eve 2004, a 911 call reported the vicious stabbing of a young woman in Wicksburg, Alabama. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, this girl just stabbed another one. One of them stabbed another one with a knot. Police found the perpetrator, 26 year old Angela Turner, drunk and trying to flee the scene while her 18 year old friend was bleeding to death. She collapsed on top of the stairs. There was a big puddle of blood. I don't think she had any idea that Angela was going to stab her. Angela claimed the stabbing was an accident, but evidence contradicted her story. It was hard to imagine her as a cold-blooded murderer. She was, in a lot of ways, a disaster waiting to happen. Was Angela Turner guilty of intentional murder, or had she caused a senseless and deadly accident? Angie was outgoing, full of life. She was everybody's sweetheart. Everybody loved Angie. Angela Denise Turner was born in Southern Alabama, the only child of Wanda and Clayton Nichols. Her parents divorced after she was born, and Angela's mother remarried several times. My grandparents pretty much raised me. Um, I was in and out with my mother. She's been married six times. Angie had a lot of stepdads, um, her mom, was more of a friend to her than a mother. Under the care of her grandparents, Angela grew up with a fun-loving nature. Angie loved to be the center of attention. She just wanted to be noticed. And she was noticed because she was very beautiful. She was a, a prankster, a joker. She would do crazy things like go through the drive through backwards. But the popular teen's wild streak led to underage drinking. My alcohol use started when I was younger, just partying and having a good time. Angie grew up knowing that her mother drank and I drank. There was always alcohol around. Drinking and hanging out was just the thing to do. I didn't realize that it could, would later lead to bigger problems. Angela dated her high school love, Mark, for nearly three years until 1995, when his life was tragically cut short in a car accident. It took me about two years to accept that he was really gone. He was out in my world. He really was. Um, and when he was killed, it, it broke me. Grief-stricken, 17-year-old Angela dropped out of high school. Looking for comfort, she rushed into a marriage two months later and soon gave birth to a daughter, Celeste. She went from one extreme to the other. Angela embraced her role as a new mother. She gave me a new purpose in life. I wanted to be there for her, you know, because my mother wasn't always there for me. But the marriage lasted only 16 months. I done the, the wife and mother thing until he decided he didn't want a wife and daughter. The young mom worked in bars to make ends meet, dated a string of boyfriends, and gave birth to a second daughter, Miranda, in 1999. I was looking for love again, you know, and and I believe I found it. Angie fell in love all the time. When she met somebody that was halfway decent to her, she was in love. On Christmas Eve, 1999, Angela again lost someone she loved to tragedy. Her current boyfriend, Robert, died in a house fire. After Robert was killed, I was drinking a half gallon every other day. It was helping me cope. 
the single mother of two spiraled into regular alcohol binges and self-destructive behavior brought on by severe mood swings. She would go from feeling very down in the dumps to high energy level with um, significant anger and outbursts of energy. I have gotten in a couple of fights at the bars. Um, I'm not going to deny that. It was drinking, being angry. Angie was always a hell raiser, but she was a very lovable person. I had my first DUI in 2001, and then my second DUI, I still didn't realize it was a problem. I told her the way she was doing was not right, and I uh, told her she was making wrong choices. It was hard watching her make all the bad decisions. We kind of lost contact for a few years. At age 25, Angela's emotional problems led her to attempt suicide. It was an elongated cut up her arm. I didn't want to be here anymore. The girls would be better off without me. Everybody would be better off without me. When she tried to hurt herself, it was just devastating to me. I was diagnosed with um, major depression and borderline personality disorder. Individuals with personality disorders have a tendency to continue to make the same type of mistakes and engage in the same types of negative behavior over and over. Angela was prescribed medication for depression, but she continued to abuse alcohol on a daily basis. The dangerous combination caused friends and family to become increasingly alarmed at her erratic behavior. She had shaved her head at one point, and I thought, geez, Angela, what's going on, you know? And think that she was losing it. Because of a dare, I shaved my head. I had drank about a half bottle of vodka, and it was a casual dare. Days later, Angela showed up at her neighborhood convenience store, completely nude. I had been drinking, and it was a joke. I just walked in naked and stood at the counter and talked. I don't know if she was drunk or high, but she was naked, for sure. She was looking for attention. She wanted somebody to care. Angela attempted suicide a second time and checked herself into the Behavioral Medicine Unit at Southeast Alabama Medical Center. It was there that Angela met another patient, 18-year-old Antoinette Jobson, who went by the name Tony. The two women struck up a friendship that would end in disaster. She told me that she had moved from Florida to take care of her brother's children and that they had gotten an argument and that was why she was on the streets. Tony was the adopted daughter of Ken and Janice Jobson. Tony had very big dreams. She loved to sing. She had a beautiful voice. Her parents worried that their beloved daughter sometimes struggled with depression. Antoinette did have a depression problem. We noticed, like manic side, she'd get real active and then drop. We were attributing a lot of it to some problems she was having in her new high school due to the fact that she was biracial. Then they put her on some medication because they felt that she was probably bipolar. Shortly after moving to Alabama in 2004 to help take care of her brother's kids, Tony Jobson checked herself into the hospital for depression. She was very aware that she had problems, and she was starting to work her way out of them. Tony grew close with a fellow patient, Angela Turner. She said the first thing she heard from me was, go on and leave me the F alone, I just want to sleep, because I had taken a bunch of sleeping pills and drank before I admitted myself in the hospital again. She found it funny, so we just started hanging out. They had been in the unit together, and uh, both of them were unhappy in their life and were uh, desperately reaching out for something to attach themselves to. Angela was hospitalized for only three days before being released. She invited Tony to live with her. This hospital had a halfway house they were sending that's her to. That's where she was supposed to go. And that's where we thought she went. I told her that she could come with me, but they don't let one crazy person check out another crazy person. So my friend Michael, he went and checked her out of the hospital for me. Angie was a people lover. She would bring anybody home with her that she thought was going down the wrong road. And she was right down that road with them. The two girls stayed together that month in the home of Angela's grandfather. Like Angela, Tony was eager to support others. According to Tony's parents, the 18-year-old wanted to help Angela and her two little girls. She loved kids. It was very common, very natural for her to take care of children. Tony was very much of a caregiver. She took care of her friends. 
When Angela decided to take her kids on an impromptu road trip to visit a friend in Maine, Tony Jobson went along. She was concerned with Angela because Angela drank, and she wanted to drive instead of letting Angela drive with the children. The one-month-old friendship became strained over Angela's drinking problem. They refer to people sometimes as being time bombs. She was, in a lot of ways, a disaster waiting to happen. When Women Behind Bars continues, I remember seeing the blood coming out of her mouth and freaking out. Number one, what's your emergency? Ah, uh, this girl just got a number. In November of 2004, 26-year-old Angela Turner was an alcoholic mother of two struggling with suicidal depression. While at a mental facility, she befriended a fellow patient, 18-year-old Antoinette Jobson, known as Tony. The two women checked out of the hospital and lived together as roommates for one month. But Angela's frequent alcohol abuse began to cause problems. When she talked about Angela and the kids, she expressed concern over the kids' well-being. I think that's why she stuck there more, because Tony thought she could help the world. Tony Jobson had planned to move back to Florida after the holidays. She was coming home for New Year's, but she wanted to stay with Angela because of the kids for Christmas. But she had no idea that by Christmas Eve, Angela Turner's drinking would escalate to a point of no return. I'd already been drinking whiskey all day long, and because of what it was, it was Robert was on my mind all day long. He is every year. Angela says thinking about the Christmas Eve death of her boyfriend five years earlier made her depressed that day. At around 5 p.m., Angela Turner and Antoinette Jobson drove together to Wicksburg to visit Angela's friends, Rocky McLean and his son, Shane. Rocky McLean, um, he was a security guard, per se, at the peanut company. He was living in a small building. It was kind of like a storage building. It was just a shed. He didn't have a bathroom, didn't have a telephone, and he had his collection of knives. There was probably 25 knives that he had up on the wall of various shapes and sizes. They're uh, rare or novelist type knives meant for one thing, and that is def definitely uh, striking, killing, or inflicting serious injury. I remember walking in the door. Shane hadn't seen my shaved head yet. And I, I grinned at him and took my wig off. And he was like, you're crazy. The girls sat across from each other, and according to the two men in the room, were arguing about the car keys. Tony wanted to drive because Angela had been drinking too much. Tony wanted the car keys, and Angela told her no. What happened next was very sudden and unexpected. I remember bickering arguing, but as far as what it was really about, I still couldn't tell you. It just happened in a split moment. I have no idea what made me grab that knife. Antoinette was sitting in a chair. Angela just reached up on the wall of the shed and pulled a knife, turned around and stabbed her in the chest. Tony was taken completely by surprise. It happened so quickly that she didn't have a time to put her hands up in front of the knife. It was an extremely sharp knife with, with the double blades. It went in through the chest, through the bone, and uh, caused massive damage inside the chest cavity. I don't remember stabbing her. I remember hearing the knife drop and then seeing the blood came out of her mouth. According to Shane McLean, right after Angela Turner stabbed Antoinette Jobson, she pulled the knife out of her. She stood there for a second. Rocky then took the knife away from her, and Angela then ran out, and Shane McLean chased her down. Angela says she was running to her godmother, Barbara's house, which was just across the highway. I had to get to the phone and get to Barbara because I knew Barbara wouldn't get help. Well, Shane McClinton chased Angela Turner coming outside the door, running around just on this driveway right here. And he tackled her close to where those yellow gates are over there. She started begging for him to release her and let her go so that she would not get in trouble. Angela was crying and screaming, I want to spend Christmas with my kids. 
Let me go, Shane. I want to spend Christmas with my kids. I asked him, did I do that? And he said, yes, you done that. And he just kept holding me down. And then Rocky went and called 911. Uh, this girl just got a letter. She is uh, bleeding profusely. You need to get uh, ambulance here quickly. While Angela was being held by Shane in the driveway, the dying teen stumbled out of the shed. That's when that Jobson stepped outside, walked down those steps there. And she came out a few feet, turned around, went back up the steps, and collapsed on top of the stairway there and was bleeding to death. Police arrived to secure the scene while paramedics attended to the victim. There had to be some type of artery that was severed by the amount of blood that was at the scene, and we were 20 miles from the hospital. Antoinette was rushed to the nearest emergency room, but she died en route. Police stayed at the crime scene to question Angela. When I first talked to Angela, she was, she was definitely upset and she was um, frightened. I can tell that she had a few drinks. She was real fidgety, real hyper. She was talking extremely fast. I give them the wrong name. I knew I had a warrant out on me for a DUI. It took us a little while to figure out who her real identity was. Angela admits she also lied to police about what happened. She told me that herself and Antoinette Jobson grabbed a couple of knives and they were fencing and just playing around. And then she lunged at Antoinette and stabbed her in the chest. And basically she was telling me that it was accidental. Forensics revealed the stab wound to be nearly three and a half inches deep. It was a high impact wound to go that deep for the direction and the penetration of that knife, uh, th there was no, it was no accident. Other evidence at the scene made detectives question Angela's version of events. There's only one knife removed from the wall. So it takes away from her story where she's saying that there was two knives out and that they were fencing. Authorities gave Turner a breathalyzer test to see how much she had been drinking that night. Her blood level was 0.247. That is about three times the legal limit. But police maintain that Angela's behavior after the crime indicated she was not too drunk to be responsible for her actions. Uh, she wasn't a totally incapacitated drunk. She knew what she was doing. She was impaired, but not that impaired. She did talk sense. She even had enough to try to be deceptive to us. The fact that she did try to elude, so to speak, and run from the situation is an indication that she was aware that something is wrong here, something is bad, and I need to get out of this situation. Authorities took Angela to the Houston County Sheriff's Department. She was arrested and booked for murder that Christmas Eve. I cried. It was hysterical crying. I would never take somebody's life on purpose. Next up on Women Behind Bars. The idea of using drunkenness as a defense is ludicrous. She was screaming and hollering at the top of her voice. Oh my God, my life is over with. And later. It was not my intention to hurt him or anything like that. They duct tape his mouth and they're going through his pockets, but he gets up and starts to run. And there's a shot fired. In the rural town of Wicksburg, Alabama, detectives spent Christmas Eve at a gruesome crime scene. 18-year-old Antoinette Jobson had been fatally stabbed by her 26-year-old friend and roommate, Angela Turner. The killing appeared to be fueled by Angela's binge drinking. She claims she does not remember stabbing her friend. I remember a couple flashes, but I don't, that's all it is. I remember seeing the blood coming out of her mouth. Antoinette's parents in Florida got the terrible phone call about the murder of their daughter that Christmas Eve. It was around 2 o'clock in the morning, and he, he told me that she was had been murdered. Rips your guts out. I, I mean, I, I can't put it any other way. She was so afraid of knives. I think she was stabbed. 
news of the homicide spread quickly through the small town community where Angela had lived. You know, I don't know I wasn't there, but I didn't think Angie had it in her to kill anybody. It wasn't the Angie I knew at all. My heart just went to my feet. I could not fathom Angie doing any harm to anybody. Angela Turner was held at the Houston County Jail awaiting trial. In January 2006, she got her chance to face the jury. We saw a very troubled young woman before us. Marriage problems, relationship problems. She had been in and out of hospitals. There was some mental problems there. The defense was hammering that she was drunk and too intoxicated to form the requisite intent to commit murder. Voluntary intoxication is not a defense in Alabama. You're responsible for every action you do, whether you're drunk or sober. The prosecution argued that despite the high alcohol content in Angela's system, she acted with intent to kill. The fact that she was evasive and lied to the police about her reasons and what, what actually happened, all of that went toward intent. The prosecution made me look like that. It was absolutely cold-hearted, just flat-out murder. She got so intoxicated this night that uh, she did something stupid and crazy. All of those things, that totality of circumstances, led the jury to believe that she was just mean. She was not psychotic. Um, she was not out of touch with reality. Uh, she knew the differences between right and wrong. I expected to see some emotion and didn't see any. I don't even think she shed a tear. Watching her in a courtroom, listening to the testimony, she killed Tony as if she walked over and stepped on a spider. And there was no more remorse than that. Angela claims she told her defense attorney, Eric Davis, she wanted to testify. I did want to take the stand because I wanted her parents to know that I did not mean to do this, that I did not mean to take her life. But Turner says her lawyer convinced her not to take the stand. By no means did Angie get a, a fair trial. I had given Mr. Davis a list of 25 people that would speak on my behalf to show when I was drinking, I would do crazy stuff like running naked through a convenience store. The uh, idea of using drunkenness as a defense is ludicrous. The defense attorney decided not to call any witnesses, and the trial was over in one day. He said they didn't prove intent, so they proved our case for us. When they come back <laughs> with a guilty verdict, it was, it was shock. I still can't believe it. Guilty was the right verdict. You kill someone, you have to pay. After the verdict was read, Cindy Lewis was the last juror to leave the courtroom. She says she will never forget seeing Angela taken off to jail as a convicted killer. I saw them chain her legs and her hands. They were escorting her and she was screaming and hollering at the top of her voice. Oh my God, my life is over with. All her tears were for herself. I didn't feel she had any remorse. The only thing she was ever interested in was getting free and getting rid of this whole situation. With all my heart and soul, I do not believe that Angie would ever hurt anybody, not intentionally. I've loved Angie from the get-go, and I really do, I really do feel responsible. I always think that if me and Angie would have stayed friends, that maybe I could have controlled, helped her control some of the things. Angela Turner is incarcerated at a medium security facility in Montgomery, Alabama. I feel like my children are paying for my crime. It tears me up, makes me feel worthless. Every day I know she thinks about it and wish she could do everything all over again. When individuals go out partying and drinking and using drugs, um, they are taking those risks and they're taking the lives of other people very often in their own hands. If you even think you may have a drinking problem, just get help. You just never know. Your life can change in literally the blink of an eye. I'm a different person today. I look at life differently. I respect life a lot more. It's easy when you're sitting in jail to be 
a good person. Tony's family is convinced that Angela is exactly where she belongs. The main thing is she stays where she's at so she does not destroy anyone else's lives. She destroyed our daughters. She destroyed her own. She destroyed her two children. That's something I have to deal with every day. I've prayed. I know, I know that I'm forgiven by God, you know, by her parents. I don't know. I hope that one day they can find that in their hearts. For the Jobsons, Christmas will forever be a painful reminder of their daughter's death. She loved holidays. Even putting decorations on a tree, I don't think we've done it since her death. You never get closure over losing a loved one. And it doesn't get easier. But you do know that the person that did it was responsible for it that's being punished. It is a tragedy on both sides. I didn't mean to. I, I did not set out to take her life. And I'm sorry. As a child, Tony always looked at a sunset. And she'd say, oh, Mom, the angels made a beautiful painting tonight. Look at the sunset. She's an angel now painting the sunset. Next up on Women Behind Bars. It was an execution-style murder. It seems that he went to the door to open the door for someone, and they pushed their way in. For more information about Women Behind Bars, go to wetv.com. On the evening of January 9, 1997, police responded to the scene of a savage murder at a brothel in Queens, New York. The victim was the brothel owner, a notorious pimp known on the streets as Blackie. He was duct taped around the head, the nose, the mouth. Detectives zeroed in on the victim's 40-year-old ex-girlfriend, Sharon Mabry, as their main suspect. Mabry had been a madam and a prostitute at the brothel, but had also worked undercover as a police informant. She has put herself in dangerous situations her entire life. After hours of intense questioning, Sharon confessed to soliciting accomplices to carry out the botched robbery of her ex-boyfriend. I wanted to get in and, uh, and get the money that was owed to me. But at the trial, she claimed her confession was falsely obtained through police brutality. The cops started threatening me. They put a gun to my head. Um, um, they made me make false statements. She is a bit of a con artist. She, she tries to connive everybody that she dealt with. Was Sharon Mabry the mastermind behind the killing of her pimp and ex-lover? Or did she take the fall for a crime she did not commit? I come from a Christian background. They were very strict in raising us to um, abide by Bible principles. Sharon Regina Mabry grew up in a middle-class community on Detroit's west side with two younger brothers and a mother who was a devout Jehovah's Witness. Sharon was so smart, and uh, I had high hopes for her. She decided that she would like to be in missionary work, and she started off real good doing that for a while. But as the young teen grew older, she rebelled against her religious upbringing. My mother couldn't control me as a teenager. She wanted to try what the world had to offer. I start looking at the subliminal messages I was getting from the TV, going to find prostitution and drugs, and I thought that was a way to make a life for myself. By the time she graduated from high school, Sharon was already committing crimes. And I just picked up on different angles of hustling, shoplifting, credit card fraud, and eventually I wound up working in a massage parlor as a masseuse, and that's when I really uh, got into the world of prostitution. By the time she was 17, she was working for a pimp in uh, Detroit. I was fascinated. He showed me closets full of furs, and women with cars, and they had a lot of jewelry, and would I like to work for him and make money? You know, I was making two to $3,000 a week at 18 years old. It's a lot of money for a young girl. While working in the sex trade, Sharon was offered drugs by her pimp, she soon developed a cocaine addiction. My drug habit escalated to every day and all day. Sharon's mother worried about the type of men in her daughter's life. She was gullible as far as relationships were concerned. As a woman, we always look for 
someone to love us. But she was looking in the wrong places. In 1982, Sharon met 34-year-old Dennis Levy. They married and moved to New York, where Levy devised a plan to help her create income selling herself for sex. He said that um, I no longer could make any money in Detroit um, as a prostitute, and he could bring me to New York, show me how it was done and how I could make a lot more money. After four years, Sharon left her husband to run her own escort service. By 1986, she had ascended into the top tiers of the underground sex trade in New York. Sharon was working as a, a madam, and she was operating out of an apartment in the area known as West Harlem, New York. I was dating another guy at that particular time, and uh, he was into the pornography business. According to court documents, on December 14, 1986, Mabry and her boyfriend committed a brutal assault on a 23-year-old woman named Lisa Dickerson. Lisa was tied to a bed and tortured for quite a considerable period. She was tortured with a blowtorch, with cigarette lighters, razors. It was a real uh, sadomasochistic type experience. Sharon insists it was her boyfriend who tortured the girl and that she never took part in the crime. At the time that the sexual assault was going on, I was out cold in the other part of the apartment on drugs. I never even knew she was there. When the boyfriend left their apartment, Lisa tried to escape. She's able to call 911, saying that she's been tortured, she's a kidnapped victim, the police show up at the apartment. Uh, Sharon is so intoxicated that she forgets Lisa is actually tied up in the bed. Sharon Mabry pled guilty to kidnapping in the second degree and served five years in prison. She claimed she refused to testify against her boyfriend because his family threatened her. He was never charged. In 1992, Mabry was released on parole. Division of Parole was making a deal with me to go back in the streets. They needed information. She knew the ins and outs of the flesh trade. Stephen Ippolito was Sharon's parole officer, and he set the ground rules for her stint as an informant. We didn't ask her to go into prostitution. We asked her to give us information. I had to not only report to parole, I also had an FBI agent that I was reporting to. Most of her information that she gave us had to do with prostitution and organized crime figures and some official corruption. She could move with fluency throughout the whole of the underworld. It was in this underworld of crime that Sharon met Herbert Horton in 1993. He had been considered a local pimp in the area. He had a brothel, um, one of the most notorious ones in Queens County at that time. He was known on the street as Blackie. We became romantically involved, and uh, I started running his place, getting him different girls. According to Sharon, she was the madam of the brothel, but also worked as a prostitute. If we didn't have a lot of girls that day to work, I would fill in quite naturally. As a mother, I felt very sad about it because I was expecting a phone call saying Sharon was gone because of that lifestyle. By 1995, she quit showing up for parole meetings and no longer provided information to police. After spending three years with Horton at the brothel, Sharon's drug addiction had overwhelmed her. In addition, her relationship with Blackie took a turn for the worse. He began to be very abusive. He was an alcoholic. Sharon says she felt trapped because Blackie controlled the money. He was holding me against my will at that point, making me run the brothel. He was telling me, if you, if you leave the brothel, you're never going to get back in. Sharon left Blackie anyway in December 1996 to work as a prostitute in Connecticut. She returned to New York weeks later, but did not reunite with her ex-boyfriend. I went to a drug house and I spent my holidays there. She laid up in that crack house and she was smoking crack and she's running out of money. The people who run the crack house were asking her for money. She comes up with this scheme and she says, I know who has money, Blackie. He always has money on him. When Women Behind Bars continues. He was duct taped around the head, the nose, the mouth, and was shot numerous times in the head. It was not my intention to hurt him or anything like that. In January of 1997, 40-year-old Sharon Mabry was a former police informant who had absconded from parole due to heavy drug addiction. She recently dumped her pimp boyfriend, Blackie, who she claims cheated her out of money. Holed up in a nearby crack house, Sharon was broke and in debt to her drug dealers. They were feeding her you know, crack cocaine, and she basically now owes them money. 
According to police, on the evening of January 9th, Blackie was attacked at his brothel by armed intruders. It was an execution-style murder. It seems that he went to the door to open the door for someone, and they pushed their way in. I believe he was fighting and trying to run. He was duct taped around the head, the nose, the mouth, and he was shot numerous times in the head. One of the victim's employees heard the murder from upstairs and called 911. Sharon claims news of Blackie's death came as a shock. I didn't even know he was killed. I was still in the drug house. Sharon went to the police precinct and identified herself as Blackie's girlfriend. She wanted permission to enter the brothel, which was now a crime scene, supposedly to retrieve her belongings. I wanted to get into the premises and get my uh, furs and my jewelry out of there. She came in, she was strung out. You could tell that she, she, was, she was addicted to drugs. I mean, she was a crackhead. She was high as a kite. She had on a, uh, a long wig, cowboy hat, cowboy boots, two suitcases. Detective Andrew Copertino sat Mabry down for interrogation. Once they found out that I had a parole warrant, it turned from a good cop to a bad cop, threatening me, uh, telling me that I knew who committed the murder. I was crying. He wouldn't let me go to the bathroom. Um, he wouldn't let me have anything to eat. She was coming down from her high. I would go get potato chips, pretzels, soda. I wanted to put some sugar into her system anyway. I didn't want to fall asleep on me. After hours of interrogation, Sharon confessed to planning the robbery of her ex-boyfriend, Blackie. Her version was Blackie owed her so much money. He never paid her. He would abuse her verbally, physically, and just treat her like a dog. I wanted to get in and, uh, and get the money that was owed to me. He usually carried anywhere between 1000 to fifteen, between eight to $1,500 in his pocket. Sharon agreed to give her confession on videotape for the assistant district attorney. In that statement, Sharon revealed that she was at the crack house when she hatched the idea of robbing Blackie. I spoke about uh, Blackie uh, being an easy person to get money from. It was not my intention to hurt him or anything like that. She named three people at the crack house who helped carry out the plan. They said they were going over to Blackie's and they did, that they would be right back. Based on Sharon's confession, police rounded up the three individuals she claimed committed the crime, but detectives quickly determined that they were not the murderers. The alibis check out. We know for sure, we are 100% satisfied that they were not involved in this. Detectives were convinced Sharon gave them decoy names to protect the real killer. There was no way Sharon did this by herself. Then, Detective Copertino got a mysterious phone call. Is this Detective Copertino? Yes, it is. The twins did it, and the person hung up. The twins did. So I kept that in the back of my mind. It took two months for that vital clue to fall into place. In April 1997, 25-year-old robbery suspect Anthony Ogaro was arrested and taken to the 105th Precinct. Detective Copertino overheard a colleague mention that Ogaro had a twin brother. Suddenly, the missing puzzle pieces in the Horton murder began to materialize. Ogaro confessed to being involved in the crime. He basically said that he was there and that Sharon had arranged this and that another individual was the actual shooter. Anthony Ogaro insisted the robbery was Sharon's idea. Because Sharon came up to me and another friend of mine and she wanted money from Blackie. As soon as the door opened, our job was to push through really quick, hold him down and grab the money out of his pocket and run. But according to Ogero, the robbery did not go as planned. They tackle him, they duct tape his mouth, and they're going through his pockets. He gets up and starts to run, and there's a shot fired. Blackie goes down. Although Ogero gave up Mabry, he refused to divulge the identity of the shooter. We personally believe it was his brother, who was twins. He never gave up his brother in this case. You could tell he's very loyal to his brother, and in no way he's giving him up. But I know deep down it was his brother. There was no direct evidence that linked her to the crime. The main evidence was, was the statement, so we had to try to discredit that and, as being uh, uh, obtained through, through police misconduct. 
The defense tried to prove that Mabry only confessed because the police were physically and emotionally threatening her. Sharon would tell me they used the psychological uh, methods to get her to say what they wanted her to say. Police deny the allegation. We knew that she knew more than what she was telling us. It was my job to get that, that truth. I would take her soda can and throw it across the room to tell me the damn truth and I would be nose to nose with her. Sharon claims her interrogation went to extremes. He kept saying, do you know what kind of gun he was killed with? Uh, and I kept saying, I, I don't know, I wasn't there. And he kept using tactics to make me say that this is the gun that was used, right? And he pointed it at my head and I was just, I just saw my whole life flash between my eyes. I said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll tell you whatever you want. Copertino admits he was tough on the ex-informant but says Mabry's life was never threatened. Different methods work with everybody. If she didn't respond to me at all, I would send in another detective. The court ruled Sharon's confession was legally obtained, and it was the prosecution's biggest weapon. Without any forensic evidence tying Mabry to the crime, the state built their case on the videotape confession, along with the testimony of one of Sharon's friends, a woman who had seen Sharon hours after the murder. According to Sharon's friend, Sharon admitted to her that she was involved, she set the whole thing up. She corroborated my false confession to the police that I had knowledge of Mr. Wharton's murder. It was her testimony that Sharon admitted to her that she killed Blackie, so that was very damaging. The defense argued that Sharon's friend had pending legal cases of her own and testified against Sharon in exchange for leniency, but the jury was not swayed. I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe that I would be convicted on, on a false statement. It was uh, her friend's testimony and the confession. That's what did her in. Sharon asserts that she did not get a fair trial and that Blackie had many enemies who wanted him dead. I believe that the, the people that had a grudge against him conspired with uh, Mr. O'Garrow and had him killed. Maybe Sharon didn't really want this guy to get killed, just wanted him to get robbed but the fact is, is that they killed him. Sharon is not a killer. She doesn't have that in her heart to hurt anyone, even though she was on drugs. I think they had to frame or put it on somebody and solve a case. Could she have been totally framed? Yeah, well, yeah, I guess it's possible too that uh, a flying saucer landed in Roswell, New Mexico. Do I think the police went out of their way to, to frame her? No, I don't think so. Sharon Mabry is incarcerated at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in New York. Being here for something you didn't do is just horrible. I tried to look at the better side of it to say, well, I'm not on drugs. I've cleaned up my life. I'm an educated black woman. But uh, just to be here, away from my family and my friends, it takes a toll. I'm very proud of her at this point. She's trying to help and talk to so many people to turn their lives around and don't go down the road she did. Refusing to give up her fight to be exonerated, Sharon also hopes to influence young women to make better choices. It's not worth it. All the money you could get for exchanging your body for economic gain. It's just not worth it. It puts you in positions where you, you don't even see the train coming. <laughs>